Now let's talk about a Supreme Court ruling that could have major ramifications for MNCs and additional revenue for the government. Now, the Apex Court has ruled that lower rates under MFN clause of a double tax avoidance agreement cannot be enforced unless it is notified under Section 90 of the Income Tax Act. The Apex Court has set aside a Delhi High Court order that had allowed for a lower withholding tax under the DTA without a specific notification. Now, several MNCs had argued that since the nations where uh, their headquarters are based out of uh, have the most favoured nation or the MFN status with India, the beneficial 5% withholding tax should apply to them as well. Currently, MNCs pay 10% tax on their dividend payouts uh, to their parent organisations. Uh, well, for more on this, I'm now joined by Mr. Dinesh Kanabar, the CEO of Dhruva Advisors. Uh, Mr. Kanabar, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you have been, uh, in, the, in a sense, advising one of the parties, Nestle, in this matter. Give us a picture of cutting through the jargon, giving us a sense of the impact that this judgment is likely to have on these companies looking uh, to repatriate funds overseas, whether it's through royalties or whether it's through dividends. So, uh, uh, two parts to it. First is just to understand basically that tax treaties are bilaterally negotiated. Sometimes that process could take years uh, for the negotiations to happen. And one of the things which generally happens in a tax treaty is, as you rightly said, there is a most favoured nation clause which obviates the need to renegotiate a treaty. So what happens is you put in a uh, treaty as it was before the Supreme Court, uh, and I would not like to go into client-specific matters, uh, but, I should, but just uh, generally to say that if you have a situation where under a tax treaty, a rate of tax is prescribed or the manner in which an item should be taxed is prescribed, and thereafter one of the contracting states, so India in this particular case, enters into a treaty with somebody else where either the rate of tax is lower or the scope is narrower and therefore one could get an advantage, that advantage would follow and be applicable to the country with whom the tax treaty is entered into. So take in this particular case which was before the Supreme Court where there were multiple uh, uh, parties, uh, the treaties which was India, Netherlands, India, France, India, Switzerland being discussed and the issue was that under this treaty there was a most favoured nation clause, which basically said that if we enter into and give benefits to somebody else, which we are not giving to you as a French company or a Swiss company or a Dutch company, then automatically those benefits will extend to you. So you are you be our most favoured nation. Uh, incidentally, Ashmit, a, a separate matter, uh, but just to give you a perspective, India had an agreement with Singapore, where they actually said that all the benefits of tax treaty, which India is giving to uh, Mauritius on account of capital gains will continue to apply to Singapore. So this is sort of a bilateral understanding. You don't need to renegotiate every time. And the question was sure. that India did enter into similar agreements uh, um, at a later point of time and whether that automatically therefore applied to these treaties or they had to be notified. And the importance of this lies in the fact that if you are required to notify and you don't notify, then sort of you are unilaterally changing the treaty. So until the Supreme Court judgment came along, it was a belief among the taxpayers, tax advisors, etc., that the wordings of MFN clause under the tax treaty was fairly clear. It provided that the moment you enter into a favorable treaty, automatically those provisions would apply to you. It was a case of revenue that until we notify, it cannot be applicable. And in one particular case, only a part notification happened and whether it was at all practicable. Sure. And what the Supreme Court has gone back to say is that the treaties are a creature of Section 90 of the Income Tax Act. Uh, Section 90 requires treaties to be notified. Sure. And therefore, any amendment to a treaty, even if it is built into the treaty, unless notified, it is not going to work. That was in sort of in some end substance one of the major aspects before the Supreme Court. Sure, Mr. Kanabar. Let me then come back to you. If we are talking about this being an important decision uh, from an MNC perspective, looking to repatriate funds back to their parent companies, uh, give us a sense of the scale of the impact. What are the numbers involved? What is the kind of impact that we're looking at when we look at some of these large MNCs operating here in India with parents overseas? Yeah. Uh, so, two parts, uh, uh, Ashwit, you know, when you and I spoke, uh, uh, and, and you mentioned earlier on that this applies to dividends, not only dividends. Uh, so, for for example, under many of the tax treaties, uh, there is a clause on fees for technical services. And 
uh, a treaty may describe a fees for technical services in very, very broad terms. And then there may be a later treaty where it is defined in a very, very narrow term. So, for example, India has tax treaties uh, where there is a make available clause, meaning that even if you get technical service, but you cannot do it yourself, then it is not taxable in India. Uh, and if such a treaty is later entered into at a later point of time, uh, then we, we have a, a similar applicability. And in, in this particular case before the Supreme Court, in the case of India, sure. the Lens Treaty, India notified the change in rates, but not the change in scope. So this applies not only to dividend, it applies to many, many other clauses, including royalties, fees for technical services. I don't think, Ashwin, there is possibility of really putting a back of the envelope number. Right. But I think the ramification of it can be understood that sure. for years this has been happening, not just has been happening for years. I can actually tell you that we go to the tax office and a tax officer actually accepts this position and grants you a low, lower withholding tax. And now, because so when a Supreme Court interpretation comes mm -hmm. and it gives the law as it always stood, all those certificates now become irrelevant. Sure. irrelevant. And the, the problem which arises, Ashwith, is let's assume that I am an Indian company. Sure. I have paid out uh, fees for technical services and I did not withhold taxes on the basis that MFN clause applied and somebody in some other treaty there was a benefit available. And now the point is that it can't apply to you. And therefore, right. now the foreign company has received the entire money. I have no ability to withhold taxes, assume that the agreement is subject to taxes. Now the tax office will look at the Indian payer and seek to recover the difference. So what we are looking at is reopening right, of the tax assessments for the past several years and claims being raised for taxes and interest. Mr. Ganabar, we're completely out of time. Just one quick question to you. Is there a legal remedy moving the knocking the doors of the Supreme Court once again through a review or a curative or perhaps approaching the OACD? Is there a remedy left or is this the status quo that we are to proceed with? Um, I, I don't know whether, I don't think that there is a remedy available of going back to Supreme Court. I think a correct remedy is to make a representation to CBDT to relook at this situation because it is sort of a, a, a payment sure. of interest over sure. years when High Court decisions have been put, uh, uh, there for so many years and if Supreme Court, be, uh, the CBDT would be well advised to right. relook at it.